We had some questions on the previous webinar regarding how to port cardiac CT angiography findings. So we presented a brief slide presentation on that. Structured reporting is really essential uh, for doing these exams. It ensures uh, quality and consistency and, and eliminates some of the inherent differences that might occur with different uh, reporters, uh, even from different specialties, radiology or cardiology, from creating reports that have a different flavor and different content. Uh, it makes sure that you get the key report elements uh, in there. They're less likely to be admitted. And then the referring doc the docs know what to expect when they get a cardiac C CT report in terms of what's going to be uh, uh, told to them, just like if they have a calf report that you're going to hear about the left main, the LAD, the circumflex, LOE function, and so forth. So the Journal of Cardiovascular CT in 2009 has a publication, this is a reference to that, volume three, number two, that uh, has you know, described what they consider the essential or required components. There are also a number of recommended or optional components in a report, but let's just review the ones that the, they absolutely feel need to be in every report uh, for cardiac CT. So, of course, you're going to have your clinical data, which will have some general indication or reason for the test and a procedure date, as well as some demographics, uh, the name, date of birth, sex of the referring physician. In terms of the procedure data, um, there are different test types. So you're going to do uh, coronary CT angiography with or without calcium scoring. And uh, if you're doing uh, retrospective gating, you may have included left ventricular function. Uh, if you're doing the study for an electrophysiologist who's interested in ablation, you may be doing it for pulmonary vein anatomy. In terms of the acquisition, uh, you should describe what the gating method is. Is this going to be a prospectively gated study where you have a single reconstruction available? Uh, Perhaps you're doing that for uh, reducing radiation dose, or is it going to be retrospective gating? Uh, and those have implications for study quality in some cases. What kind of medications are given? What kind of contrast? How much contrast? Did you use beta blockers? Did you use nitroglycerin? Should be recorded on every test. And then if there was any complications, if the patient uh, blew their IV or got a rash or, you know, it would be hard to predict whether they had any renal insufficiency because that's going to be several days later, but there are usually immediate complications that may occur during the test, which are extremely rare but should be reported if present. Finally, you're going to get to the results section, and uh, we always like to say something about the technical quality of the study. It gives the reader some information about uh, how reliable is this information? And the types of things would be, for example, a bolus timing. Was the contrast arriving in the coronary at the time that the scan was done? Or was the scan done too early or too late? Was the patient overweight and do you have a lot of graininess and noise, which uh, may affect resolution? Or is there artifacts, either due to calcium, uh, motion, uh, metal that may be present in the scan that will affect the interpretation of the study? Finally, the coronary arteries, uh, if a calcium score is done, you should report uh, individual vessel scores as well as a total score and estimated severity. If there are any coronary anomalies, uh, those should be described. And then in particular, uh, the coronary stenosis, uh, if present, describing both the location and the severity of the stenosis uh, as well as some information about the lesion itself. And then if there are some uninterpretable segments, and we discussed that on the first case that we reviewed where we had some motion artifact in the distal right coronary, uh, we need to transmit that information uh, that uh, there are some areas perhaps that we don't have full information. In that particular case, it didn't affect management because we already found some severe disease elsewhere. There should always be some information about the non-coronary vessels, so you're going to Talk about the aorta, is it enlarged, dilated, is there atherosclerosis, uh, the vena cava, do they have a normal course, the pulmonary arteries, are there filling defects, the pulmonary veins, how many, uh, how do they come in, if the patient's had an ablation before, is there a stenosis there or not. To continue on the results, we like to discuss cardiac chambers, so any abnormal dilatation, for example, left atrial, left ventricular enlargement, 
or perhaps a large patient with sleep apnea that has an enlarged right ventricle? Are there any masses present? Are there thrombus present in the atrium? Are there shunts, atrial septal defects, patent foramenal volleys, ventricular septal defects, or other structural disease? And those should be described in detail. Uh, the pericardium is nicely visualized. So if there's an abnormal thickness, calcification, presence of a pericardial effusion, of course, essential uh, parts of your report. And then anything in the non-cardiac uh, portion of the scan. And a lot of these scans are not full chest, so you're going to miss the apices of the lungs, uh, and you may have some of the lateral walls cut out in the viewing field. But if you do see abnormalities in the lungs, such as masses, anything in the mediastinum, uh, in the esophagus problem, like we described in the first case, or bony structure changes in the chest wall, those should all be included as part of the report. And then finally, the impression and conclusions. Uh, you want to uh, summarize your coronary interpretation your abnormal non-coronary cardiac findings, and then your abnormal non-cardiac findings, such as a finding in the lung or the esophagus.